الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد my dear brothers and sisters assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to today's session on islamophobia within the canadian context and how it impacts us as a community so what i wanted to start off by discussing was a, a story and i want us to go back to the christchurch incident that happened where over 50 people were killed in New Zealand and uh, many, many more were injured. That happened on a Thursday evening and the very next day was Juma. And I remember that day being on the Mambar, um, preparing for my khutbah and, and beginning my khutbah and all that I felt was fear at that time that the RCMP and the police had notified us that be very careful and cautious of a copycat incident that there were reports that across the world that people would write, would uh, would be replicating what had happened in Christchurch. So any time an individual walked in, there was always an immense amount of fear within the congregation. And any time someone walked in, people would look back to see if it was someone they recognized. If it was, there was a sigh of relief, and we would continue. But if it was, if it wasn't, it was as if someone was sucking the air out of the room, and time was slowing down, and that you could just sense the fear in the room at that time. And for me, that was uh, and the impact of Islamophobia on the community. That when you see something horrendous that happens to our community on a, on a worldwide scale, it's not something that just impacts that community. It's, it has an impact across the globe, across the Ummah. And that is something that is very, very real. So now when we look at Islamophobia in Canada, I want to start off by discussing definitions. Definitions are very, very important. So the definition that I use is actually based off of uh, an academic scholar's Todd H. Green. He has a book called The Fear of Islam. And the definition that he uses for Islamophobia is the fear of and hostility towards Muslims and Islam that is rooted in racism and that results in individual and systemic discrimination, exclusion, and violence targeting Muslims and those perceived as Muslims. Now, when we talk about definitions, you'll, uh, you, you'll see that there's a a big discussion amongst academics and amongst scholars. How do we define Islamophobia? Should we even be using the term Islamophobia or should we be using the term anti-Muslim hate? This discussion stems from what a phobia actually is. And usually it is an illogical fear of something, a fear that is not grounded in reality. And thus when they say Islamophobia, it means that people are actually afraid of Islam for uh, no apparent reason. But fear does not bring about action that results in something being harmful. And it doesn't happen at a systemic level. So some academic scholars, they have decided that, you know what, we're going to be using the term anti-Muslim hate. And that seems to be more appropriate and more adequate. But regardless, I want us to understand that when we talk about whether Islamophobia or anti-Muslim hate, there are multiple layers to it. It can happen at an individual level. It can happen at a systemic level. It can manifest itself in terms of systemic discrimination or even exclusion, that Muslims are not a part of the discussion, they're not getting certain jobs, they're not being included in, uh, in policies and policy making. And it can also result in terms of violence targeting them. And I think this is the most apparent one that has been taking place over the past few years, that Muslims have been direct targets of physical violence. Now, what are, when we think about Islamophobia, is this something that just happens by individuals randomly? Or is there an organized agenda behind it? And this is where I want to introduce the concept of organized Islamophobia. So Todd H. Green, you'll see, uh, speaks about this. You'll also find Professor uh, Arun Kudnani. He speaks about this and multiple other um, academics as well. So they break down organized Islamophobia in terms of what they're trying to achieve and what the objectives behind this organized Islamophobia actually are. So the first argument they bring forth is that Islam is monolithic and static. What exactly does that mean? Meaning that Muslims and Islam across the world, across the globe are exactly the same. Now, why would they use this type of argument? This argument is used because they will put groups like Daesh, groups like Al-Qaeda at the forefront, and they will say all of Islam and all of Muslims are like this. So this is the first objective to say that all of Islam is monolithic and static and it does not change from place to place, uh, nor do they have different uh, viewpoints 
or different beliefs, but rather all of it is the same. And then they use the worst of the ummah to be uh, the poster child of the ummah. And as we know ourselves, Islam is not monolithic and Islam is not static. In terms of the different denominations that exist, in terms of the different ideologies that exist, in terms of the political, social viewpoints that exist, even within the elections themselves that just passed, we saw Muslims that were running for the uh, Liberal Party, we saw Muslims that were running for the NDP, Muslims that were running for the Conservative Party. So even within political viewpoints, there is a wide diversity within our community in Canada. So we have to find this argument that Islam is monolithic and static. Now static uh, is a very important term, particularly when you look at it from a uh, Sharia and Fiqh standpoint. We have this concept of urf, we have uh, this principle al-adam muhakkama. So urf being the social uh, norms of a community and a society. And al-adam muhakkama meaning that the norms of a people actually play a very important position uh, in the role of fiqh. So Islam naturally takes the shape of the society that it is present in as long as it doesn't oppose uh, direct principles of the Sharia. So with that being said, Islam is not static, but rather it embraces the good of every culture that it comes into. The second objective that uh, organized Islamophobia tries to bring forth is Islam as separate and the other, meaning that Islam cannot be homogenous with the communities that it goes into, particularly when you look at France and you know even uh, you know in, in our case and scenario Quebec that Islam is always viewed as the other. You can never actually be French. You can never actually be Quebec because of your Islam. And you will see that uh, President Macron in uh, France has made it very explicit by calling it Islamic separatism. When in reality, if you look at how Muslims view themselves in multiple surveys that have been conducted, Muslims view themselves as a part of the society and community that they are in. And you'll find them in all aspects of life whether it is your taxi driver, your Starbucks barista, your Tim Hortons coffee maker, your local engineer, your local maintenance person, your local accountant, up uh, the chain as well. You know, we have CEOs and organizations. Uh, we even have great examples of, of community members like uh, Muhammad Faqih from uh, Paramount Foods, right? So Muslims are, uh, are there in all aspects of life and they are a part of civil society. They're even a part of the political realm. You have a uh, liberal Muslim caucus that I was fortunate enough to meet. And these are all the liberal parliament mem parliamentary members that identify as Muslim. And you know, I want to give a, a, a shout out to one of my childhood friends, Samir Zuberi, who is now a, a PM um, in Quebec out of uh, Dollard and, uh, and, and the West Island. So you will see that they are everywhere. So Islam is not separate, but as we mentioned, it allows the uh, integration of Muslims into all aspects of society and all aspects of life. Then the third argument that they bring forth is Islam as inferior. <clears throat> and perhaps this is a common argument that we've heard um, throughout history. <clears throat> Please excuse me. This is a, a common argument that we've heard throughout history that Islam is archaic, Islam is barbaric, Islam cannot accommodate to the times that we live in. And interestingly enough, some of the main ideologues that address this issue are usually reformist Muslims or people that identify as ex-Muslims. So Ayan Hirsi, Irshad Manji, um, and, and these likes of individuals. So they say that Islam is misogynistic, Islam is oppressive uh, in nature. And a lot of the times what ends up happening over here is people take their own individualized experiences and project it upon Islam. This is not to say that at uh, a family level or even at certain times at a, a community level that oppression does not take place within the, within islam it happens without a, a shadow of a doubt this can be domestic violence that this, this can be misogyny this can be all forms of things but is the root cause islam or is the root cause the human condition and is the root cause maybe even cultural misunderstandings that are done within the name of islam and often that is what ends up happening so when we talk about Islam as inferior, meaning that Islam cannot stand the challenges of democracy, Islam cannot stand the challenges of, of capitalism and all of these things, right? So that is the argument that is usually brought forth. How do you actually counter this argument? Again, let's just take it back to the communities that they feel are oppressed 
and let those individuals speak for themselves. And alhamdulillah, you'll see our sisters within the Muslim community are, are doing a phenomenal job uh, at the forefront. You know, most recently we saw uh, Janela Massa on, on, on the CBC getting her own show. We see Sister uh, Amir Al Gawabi, you know, often um, writing editorials and she's doing a, a great job in anti racism right now. So we do have sisters at the forefront, and these sisters are very, very important voices that need to be empowered. Those authentic voices from the community, grounded within Islamic principles, those voices need to be empowered and they need to be brought to the forefront to share their opinions so that these arguments can be countered. Now, I want to highlight something over here, is that oftentimes we feel that if we logically structure an argument, this will convince someone. But in interacting with these people, that are either reformist Muslims or are ex-Muslims, you'll see that no matter how logical you are, it's not going to convince them. Because their understanding of these issues, while they claim it is very logical and very academic and very structured, it actually stems from a very emotional place where some sort of trauma has often taken place. It's not to say all the time, but often some sort of trauma has taken place. And this is how uh, the reaction is manifesting itself. And then the last objective of organized Islamophobia is Islam as the enemy. And if, uh, you know, I'll, I'll share the PowerPoint slide and maybe we can make it uh, available somewhere. But I have this quote from uh, Robert Spencer. Now you hear a name like Robert Spencer and you're like, how threatening could it be? But Robert Spencer in the world of, um, I don't even want to say academia because he's not an academic, but in terms of ideologues, people that like to speak and present themselves is one of the most Islamophobic people you will ever come across. So one of the quotes that I have from him is that there is no Muslim version of love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, or if anyone strikes you, you turn the other cheek uh, to them. So meaning that there is no peaceful version of Islam, that all of Islam is violent. And this is uh, one of the objectives to try to prove that Islam is the enemy and Islam is here to uh, subjugate you and to threaten your lifestyle. I remember very early on um, in a post 9-11 world, we had Fox News that, you know, on, on live TV is saying that, do you know what your Muslim neighbor is up to? Are they going to be claiming jihad against you? And these sorts of um, very frightening slogans uh, to divide uh, the community into Muslim and non-Muslim, saying that the Muslims are going to come to persecute you with their quote unquote Sharia law. So that is how they try to um, divide the community into those that are safe and those that are peaceful and loving versus those that are the enemy. And then they show a, a picture of a Muslim at that time. So these are the four main objectives uh, that are identified. You can uh, see this in a, in a report called uh, the Runnymede Report. They did this report in the early, uh, sorry, in the late 90s. And then they did it again um, in the uh, um, late 2010s. So 20 years later, they showed what they found and what the objectives behind organized Islamophobia actually are. And you'll see that in terms of organized Islamophobia, there is a lot of funding that takes place from right-wing neoconservative uh, individuals and organizations, something to the tune of $39 million in like 2014 was put into organized Islamophobia to basically show Muslims as monolithic and static, separate, inferior, and as the enemy. Now, how does this impact? So once we understand their objectives, how close is it coming to reality? Someone can try to do something, but is it actually affecting people on the ground? And I wanna share some statistics with you. So in 2009, uh, Angus Paul Reed found that 68% of Quebecers uh, held an unfavorable view of Islam and in 2013, that uh, increased to 69%. It increased to 69%. This increase of Islamophobic attitudes in the rest of Canada was greater than it was in Quebec, rising from 46% in 2009 to 54% in 2013. A survey in 2012 shows 52% of Canadians feel that Muslims can only be trusted a little bit or not at all. 42% of Canadians think discrimination against Muslims is mainly their fault, is mainly their fault. A 2015 survey conducted in Quebec found that 49% of respondents would be bothered if they received services from someone wearing the headscarf. So can you imagine a sister serving you at Tim Hortons or at Starbucks or providing any other service at all? 
almost 50% of respondents from Quebec found that they would be disturbed if they found someone in hijab serving them. In July 2016, a survey by the polling for Maru and VCR and C reported that only a third of Ontarians had a positive impression of Islam. So, you know, we often think that Quebec is the problem, but even within Ontario, two thirds of Ontario, even in Ontario, two thirds of Ontarians um, had a negative view of Islam, had a negative view of Islam. And more than half believe that mainstream Islamic teachings promote violence. So more than half, more than 50% believed that Islamic teachings were violent. Three quarters said that Muslim immigrants have fundamentally different values. A 2017 report shows that 51% of Canadians support government surveillance of mosques as compared to 46% of Americans. You know, often we love to demonize uh, our counterparts south of the border and saying that surveillance um, and uh, national security interference is an American problem. But in reality, we see that it impacts Canada as well. And even within um, our societies itself, 51% support that governments survey mosques even though to the best of my knowledge there has been very very little documentation of any form of radicalization or extremism taking place within the mosque itself taking place within the mosque itself yet just because that is where muslims pray and that is where muslims congregate they assumed that if we survey the mosques and put surveillance there that we will be able to find those extremists that eventually become uh, terrorists and obviously that is very, very misinformed and is very Islamophobic. A 2017 Angus Reid poll found that 46% of Canadians had an unfavorable view of Islam. So again, that's almost half. So these are um, surveys that were done from the 2000s up until 2017. Those are the last statistics that I was able to find. And I'm sure we'll be finding more statistics um, as you know the, the, the recent election uh, has just concluded. We will probably come across uh, some more statistics as well as the uh, census that took place. Now, these statistics are very, very uh, concerning without a shadow of a doubt. You know, we see this in Quebec, we see this in Ontario, in Alberta in particular, even though I haven't shared any statistics from Alberta, we do find that often there are regular attacks upon colored uh, Muslim women of hijab. Um, happening so often that it's not even worth reporting anymore according to the media uh they've just stopped reporting it all together so these are some very alarming statistics and this is to show that as a community we do have a, a lot of work to do in terms of making sure that we are protected making sure that we protect our own interests and making sure that we are fairly represented uh wherever we are in society now let's get to physical attacks that have taken place and the physical attacks I've broken down into uh, attacks on Muslim women, attacks on masajid, and then some of the major attacks that have taken place. So in terms of attacks on Muslim women, in 2011, a woman uh, with naqab was, had her naqab pulled off and was assaulted in Mississauga. In 2013, a 17-year-old was punched in the nose and had her hijab pulled off in St. Catharines. In 2015, a pregnant woman in Toronto wearing hijab was assaulted and falls as a result. In 2020, two Muslim women were assaulted, car windows smashed, obscenities screamed at them, and several more in 2021 that mainly took place in Alberta. Attacks on Masajid, December 31st, 2013, a bomb threat was made against the Vancouver Masjid and the building was evacuated. On November 26, 2014, a bomb threat was made against a Montreal Masjid and the police found a suspicious package. 12 buildings in the area were evacuated. On November 14th, 2015, the only mosque in Peterborough, Ontario, was set on fire. On November 12, 2020, and this is, um, you know, one of the uh, attacks that should be considered major. But again, because it was a Muslim life and not of a, Caucas a Caucasian white male, um, it didn't receive as much attention as it should have. But on September 12, 2020, Muhammad Aslam Zafis was stabbed in the neck and killed outside of the IMO mosque uh, in Rexdale, Ontario. Rahimahullahu rahmatan wasi'ah. Um, you know, the caretakers of the masajid are, are a very elevated position within Islam. It is a very elevated position. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in the Quran that it is only the people of taqwa that will be taking care and establishing the masajid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we believe that Muhammad Aslam Zafis, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept him as shaheed, uh, inshallah, was of those uh, people. And on October 12, 2020, 
a Toronto mosque was threatened. Uh, messages received by the masjid included to do Christ church all over again, to do Christ church all over again. So these are um, some of the attacks that have taken place upon Muslim women and upon masajid. Now getting to the main ones, and these are the, the ones that received national attention and hopefully are, are bringing about some sort of policy change. Uh, they are on January 29th, 2017. Alexander Bissonnet uh, opened fire upon worshippers in the Islamic Cultural Center of Quebec, killing six and wounding 19 others as they prayed Salatul Aisha. And we had uh, Khalid Bil Qasimi, Azuddin Sufyan, uh, Abu Bakr Thabti, Ibrahim Barri, uh, Mamadou Tanu Barri, and Abdul Karim Hassan, Rahimahumullah, Rahmatan Wasi'a, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive them uh, and raise the ranks and accept them as Shaheed. I mean, they were killed uh, in that incident. And again, what is really, really disturbing is that prior to this incident taking place, the masjid had reached out to local authorities saying that someone had left uh, the head of a decapitated pig, uh, yet they did nothing about it. There was a foretelling and they did nothing about it. Multiple reports were made, yet they did nothing about it till Alexander Bissonnette uh, came and started opening fire and more people would have been killed um, you know, if guns did not jam and other individuals did not step up uh, to protect the most vulnerable. And that is what happened in our own soil here in Canada, uh, a, a country that claims to have embraced multiculturalism and diversity and stands up for its most vulnerable, failed on that day when a community, our own community, uh, had to suffer this great loss in Quebec City. And it would be sad enough if that's where it stopped, but in fact it continued. In June 6th of 2021 in London, Ontario, we had Yumna, 15 years old, Madiha, 44 years old, Talaat, 74 years old, and Salman Afzal, 46 years old, all run over by a truck and killed in London, Ontario. And while we share the statistic, yes, these are the ones that passed away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon them and forgive them and raise their ranks and accept them as shaheed. Faiz is not mentioned because Faiz is the son that survived. And for me, I feel that that is often the most difficult issue to discuss, that your whole family was killed and taken down with you, yet it was the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you stayed alive. Now, when you study these uh, incidents, there is something called survivor's guilt, that people feel guilty for surviving these incidents when others were killed and did not survive. Now you can imagine what that means when it is your own sister, your own mother, your own grandmother, and your own father. That this young brother will no longer be there to uh, you know, help his sister out, but also to tease her and to make fun of her like siblings often do. He will no longer receive hugs and kisses from his mother. He will no longer be able to play sports uh, or work with his father in the garage. That grandmother will not be there to provide that grandmotherly love that we all uh, embrace and, and, and desire. All of that was stripped away from him because of this one individual that feared just harmless Muslims walking down the street uh, around Maghrib time, having performed no crime other than being visibly Muslim. So this was the most recent catastrophic attack that took place. One of the positives that came out of this was that the Liberal government uh, announced in the Islamophobia Summit that Alhamdulillah, you know, the NCCM, I believe, tried its best uh, to coordinate and help out with so that more policies can be made to protect our community and the interests of the Muslim community, as well as other minority groups. We also had uh, the anti-Semitism uh, summit the day before that. So as we can see, right-wing extremism is drastically growing. Anti-immigrant sentiment is drastically growing. And we have these um, neo-Nazi groups, Aryan race groups that are drastically growing, that hate to see visible minorities and their identity feels threatened uh, by the presence of them. So now what I wanted to share with you is what is a closed view of Islam versus what is an open view of Islam. And this is in eight different categories. Again, this is from the uh, Rani Mead report that I'm referring to that you can find online as well. So a close, So when we talk about um, Islam being monolithic versus Islam being diverse, a closed view is that Islam is monolithic and open view is that Islam is diverse. 
uh, a closed view is that Islam is separate, an open view is Islam is interacting. Uh, a third is that Islam is inferior versus Islam is different, right? Inferiority and different are, are two very different things. Uh, number four, Islam as the enemy versus Islam as the partner. Number five, Islam as manipulative versus Islam being sincere. Criticism of the West rejected versus criticism of the West considered. Discrimination is defended versus discrimination is criticized. And Islamophobia seen as natural versus Islamophobia seen as uh, problematic. So these are closed and open views of Islam in eight main categories. Um, and this is something that needs to be studied at a deeper level. So particularly when we are doing, you know, uh, open masajid for the community, when we are doing presentations on uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, these are some of the things that need to be addressed um, in those discussions and to make sure that people do not hold closed views of Islam or the Muslim community. And then we also talk about what does Islamophobia actually look like? And it manifests itself in four main ways, in exclusion, in discrimination, in violence, and in prejudice. So when you look at the media, what type of stories are you seeing in the media about the Muslim community? Often you'll find that anytime there's a terrorism slash extremism case, they plaster the identity of the individual and their faith. Is that done with other faith groups and other minority groups? Often not. But the question over here arises is that why is it that when it comes to terrorism, that is the only time we feel that we need to mention someone's faith as if it is their faith that contributed to that. Faith is not relevant in criminality, particularly in those cases. We look at discrimination. This can happen in employment places. We see people that have Muslim sounding names like Muhammad, Khadija and Fatima are less likely to uh, receive, uh, to, to be accepted and to get interviews. We see it in provision of services, whether education or whether it be health. So now you look at the situation in Quebec, uh, a woman that wears hijab cannot work in a public school, cannot uh, work in a, in a public hospital. So this is a form of discrimination that takes place. We see exclusion in terms of politics and government that Muslims often are not accepted. Uh, we also see it in terms of, um, you know, climbing up the corporate ladder that will, they will not uh, receive those promotions, even though they are deserving of them as their counterparts that do end up receiving them. And then last but not least, we see violence in terms of physical assaults uh, that we spoke about, vandalizing of property, uh, this can be houses and it can also be masajid and community centers. Right here in Calgary, I know of an individual that was living next to an Islamophobic neighbor that would spray paint uh, vulgarities regularly. Yet when the police was called, often nothing is done about it. And it is just uh, assumed that these are problems with by neighbors uh, within communities that will resolve themselves. Eventually that brother had to sell his house and move to a different community. And then verbal abuse. And this is something that happens regularly. I want you to imagine that something like Christchurch happens, something like the Quebec mosque shooting happens, and a Muslim comes into work the very next day. And there's such passive aggressive statements that are made, such as we're so sorry for your loss, but you're not going to kill us now, are you? These are actually reported incidents that take place. So that what seems like such a nice gesture that someone's sharing their condolences, turns into something that is very, very passive aggressive, and it is verbal abuse. Making fun of hijab, making fun of skin color, making fun of religious practices even. Um, these are things that happen on a regular basis that due to their frequency often go unreported. Now, what are resources that uh, you can use and refer to? So there are three books that I wanna recommend. Number one is the Islamophobia industry, how the right manufactures hatred of Muslims. This is by Nathan Lean. Then we have the fear of Islam that I refer to. This is by Todd H. Green. What is Islamophobia? This is a, a compendium edited by uh, Narzanin Masumi, which is great. Then you have online reports that are available. The Runnymede report from 1997 and 2017. Project Someone that addresses Islamophobia in 2019. Then you have papers uh, in Canada. So you have Sarah Wilkins Laflam from Waterloo that has a, a dissertation and uh, Sabina Ghaffar Siddiqui from McMaster that uh, has a dissertation as well. So these are academic papers that you can look at. And then last but not least, even a website called the Islamophobia Network.com. Islamophobia Network.com. These are some of the resources that are available. 
getting to my conclusion, I have this wonderful picture, subhanAllah, that I wish um, I could have shared with you. But if you go on to YouTube and you look at um, short clips that Yaqeen Institute has made, they use this picture from a previous presentation that I did with them. And it's uh, a, a young sister in Scandinavia that they're outside protesting a mosque, trying to get it shut, shut down or prevent its construction. And then she's taking a selfie and she has like a peace sign that she's making uh, like this, just mocking the people that are there. And, um, you know, oftentimes that's what we have to resort to is that you fight discrimination by showing that it doesn't affect you. Now that often doesn't, that that's not often a viable option because as I've mentioned, Islamophobia impacts people at a very, very deep level. So much so that even masajid feel threatened at Jum'ah time because they're afraid as to what's going to happen. I remember my local masjid uh, in the South Shore of Bursard in uh, Montreal, they had to lock their masajid during Salah times just out of fear that something would happen. That was the reality on the ground. So let's get to the conclusion. Uh, I want to start off by discussing our identity and our faith. That in the post 9-11 world, one of the things that we saw that there was a very, very quick jump within the Muslim community, that if we change our names, if we change the way that we look and removing hijabs and shaving our beards uh, and only wear quote unquote Western clothing, that perhaps we will be more embraced and we will be more loved and we will not be threatened. But often what we've seen in these sort of situations and in these sort of cases, that it is, has nothing to do with who you are or what you look like and has everything to do with the individual that is hateful and spiteful. So it has nothing to do with the way that you look or the way that you dress and it has everything to do that they feel threatened and they want to hate you for your mere existence. The fact that you exist, they want to hate you. Now this is not to say that this is the majority of Canadians uh, or this is the majority of, of, of any group of people, but we have to recognize that these people do exist. And when we change our names and when we take off our, our hijabs and we shave our beards and we look at, uh, change the way that uh, we dress under this presumption, 20 years later, we have realized the adverse effects of it, that it has an impact on even our spiritual identity, that when we sacrifice our physical identity, it has an impact on our spiritual identity, that those people feel more distant from the Muslim community as a whole. Now, I want us to understand something, that just because someone shaves off their beard or takes off their hijab, that these are personal decisions that people make, often coming perhaps from a, a position of trauma, that we need to understand that perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive them and will recognize the other good deeds that they have and it is not our position to be judgmental of them. But our position is that as long as they are Muslim, then we have to embrace them as a part of our community. They are people that are a part of our community that uh, can contribute and do have a lot to offer. So it's very important that even those individuals that did make that decision, that we are still inclusive of them and try to help them and hold them by the hand and, and help them as much as we can. But we have seen over the past two decades that individuals that made those decisions, not only did it uh, impact them individually, but it did not improve the situation of the community either. Which moves, uh, brings me to point number two, is that as these Islamophobic attacks happen, and I, I want to address uh, discrimination as a whole, whether it is uh, anti-Semitic, uh, whether it is uh, sexist, whether it is ageist, whatever it may be, that we have to make sure that we stand up for individuals and that we stand up for the rights of every uh, human being. That there are some immutable rights that everyone should have access to. And one of them is feeling safe. One of them is feeling safe. So if you do see acts of discrimination taking place, intervene when it is safe. Intervene when it is safe to do so. So as long as there's no harm that is imminent to yourself or to someone else, do intervene and stand up for people. That is what good human beings do, and that is what Islam advocates for as well. Number three is making sure that hate crimes get reported. And when we talk about hate crimes being reported, this is to your local uh, police department, this is to the RCMP, this is to the NCCM, um, and anyone else that is you know, recording and documenting hate crimes, hate crimes taking place. I know it is often tedious. I know it requires 
a lot of patience. I know it requires a lot of hard work, but when it comes time to lobby and to create policy, statistics are looked at. And if those statistics are not present, then it becomes much, much more difficult to lobby for change in policy. So it is important that if someone says something Islamophobic to you or harms you in any way, then at that time, it is important to report those hate crimes. And then last but not least is the importance of increasing literacy and educating and discussing where whether you are at school, whether you are at work, you know, you should not shy away from your faith. And the more you discuss your faith and the more you normalize the discussion of your faith, the more likely you are to persuade public opinion. In fact, studies have shown that those have, that have actually interacted with Muslims are more likely to have a positive opinion of Islam and the Muslim community than those that have not, than those that have not. Um, in this day and age where there is a, an increased demand of equity, diversity, and inclusion, and more uh, sensitivity and diversity trainings are taking place, make sure that Islam and anti-Islamophobia uh, is on the agenda and are being discussed. And if you need help organizing an event like that within your workspace, and they've allowed you to do so, reach out to the NCCM, or if you're in Alberta, reach out to myself, and I'll gladly uh, help you with that, either myself, or at least help you uh, prepare so that you can do it yourself. And these are important discussions uh, that need to be had. And then last but not least, I want us uh, to understand the importance of taking spiritual measures. And that is by making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he protects us and our communities, that he keeps us safe, that he allows us to thrive in this life and the next. Making sure that we are making our adhkar regularly at the head of them, those adhkar that are for protection. Like, Bismillah alladhi la yadurru ma'a ismihi shay'un fil ardi wa la fil sama' wa huwa samiyul alim. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa taught us to say this at the uh, beginning and ending of every day as a part of the adhkar al-sabah wa al-masa. So you can find it in Hishn al-Muslim, the My Dua app. You can find it in those places. So taking those spiritual means is just as important, if not more important, than the physical means. And this is what I wanted to share with you today in terms of Islamophobia in Canada and some of the things that we can do to protect ourselves spiritually and physically as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Jazakumullah khairan for your attention. Inshallah, now we'll just ask the Sheikh a couple of questions. Jazakumullah uh, khair, Sheikh Naveed, um, for giving us uh, so much information regarding Islamophobia in Canada, how Muslims are feeling, and everything that relates to us living here in the West, and all the things that are affecting the Muslims here in the West. So our first question is uh, from a sister. As a Muslim girl that wears hijab, what do you recommend Muslim women to help protect themselves mentally in this day and age? As someone who has experienced hate crimes, I find it difficult to come back to my Muslim identity in Canada. What do you recommend for people struggling with this? Zakubah khair. Saying actually oh there we go let me firstly start off by saying that i pray that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes things easy for you and guides you to what is best and protects you and keeps you safe it is the unfortunate reality that our sisters are often the primary victims of these hate crimes under the under the presumption that they are weak uh, and cannot stand up for themselves but we as a muslim community view our sisters at the forefront being the ambassadors of islam and being perhaps the uh, stronger of the two parts of our community. Now, all that to say, I think, as I've mentioned, it's important to take those spiritual means, such as making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help and making those adhkar that will protect us. Then also in terms of physical means, understanding that sacrificing on your identity um, is not uh, a choice that you should make except as a, as a very, very last resort. 
So what are other alternative options? What that looks like is whenever a sister goes out, whenever possible, try to go out as a group. Do not try to go out as an individual. Do not go to places that are renowned uh, for discrimination. Do not go to a place uh, that is renowned for, for criminality and try to stay away from those places, particularly uh, later on in the evenings. Number two is that create some sort of support group where people can actually talk about the incidents that are impacting their lives, right? We have support groups for all sorts of things and Islamophobia needs to be uh, understood in that light as well, that it is a, a traumatic experience that people go through. So when we create those support groups in our masajid, in our organizations and create capacity for people to come and talk about their issues and get resolution and some sort of closure from those incidents, then I think that is going to uh, be something very, very positive. Number three, educate and speak out wherever possible. And oftentimes we feel that, you know what, who am I to do so? But we live in a day and age where stories are very, very powerful and they are one of the strongest form of narratives. So if you are able to share your experience, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you tawfiq, you'll find that it will have a very positive impact in humanizing the Muslim community. And it sounds horrendous having to say that, but when we are able to humanize our community, um, people are much more likely to be sympathetic and empathetic towards us. So we need to make sure that those stories get out and your story is very, very important. Uh, so please do share it. All that to say is that when we take these steps, understand that we're not just standing up for ourselves, but the decisions and the actions that we take today have a huge impact on the world that we create for tomorrow, whether it is for new Muslims, uh, for our children, for our grandchildren, whoever it may be, even for our own selves. So yes, in this day and age, there is a requirement of struggling for the sake of our identity, but when we do so, it makes things easier for the future. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us all tawfiq and protects us all and keeps us safe. Ameen. Jazakumullah khair, Sheikh. Uh, those uh, answers are very beneficial for us. Um, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easier for our sisters, uh, especially being uh, so plain in sight sometimes because of their hijab. We ask Allah to get, Allah to grant them more strength and uh, strengthen their faith. Now we have another question. Uh, so the brother is asking, could you please highlight some of the project and effort taken by Muslim organizations and leaders to clarify the picture of Islam and Muslims? How much money is spent by Muslim organizations to address Islamophobia uh, in contrast to what you indicated of $39 million spent to promote Islamophobia? Alhamdulillah, And that's a phenomenal question. And I love the fact that people are concerned in terms of what are we as a community doing to counter those narratives that are put out against our community. Now let's talk about the reality on the ground. The reality on the ground is to the best of my knowledge, we only have one Muslim advocacy group, which is the NCCM, the National Council of uh, Canadian Muslims. There were other groups like AMPAC in Alberta, but um, they were embraced by the NCCM. And I'm sure there are some other groups in Ontario that I'm not fully aware of. But at the end of the day, if you look at the NCCM's budget from like two years ago, it was maybe something like a million dollars. In the face of the 39 million is horrendous, but also in the face of other advocacy groups of minorities that have like $16 million budgets. So clearly uh, we haven't done a good job in terms of empowering our advocacy groups. Alhamdulillah, within the past year or so, you know, NCCM's capacity has drastically increased, which I'm very, very happy for. But as always, there's still more that can be done. There's still more that can be done. So now when we think of giving zakat to such organizations, we have the Canadian Council of Imams that has said that NCCM is zakat eligible. When we think about Sadaqa Jariya projects, in terms of empowering the lobbying arm of NCCM and creating uh, policy changes for the Muslim community in Canada and the long-term effect that it will have, inshallah, those aspects can also be considered uh, a sadaqa jariya from this particular perspective. So more awareness is needed and more funds uh, need to be diverted to such projects. All that to say is that we should not wait for the NCCM itself or other similar organizations to do this job. 
but rather those Muslims that are in school, that are in the workplace, that are in the public sphere, need to embrace their Muslim and Islamic identity and talk about their faith. Often you'll find that it is only something negative taking place that Islam is mentioned, but we can counter those narratives that when we do something good and people are curious, you know, why did you do this or where did this goodness stem from? We attribute it to Islam, that Islam taught me to be courteous to people. Islam taught me to be kind to the elderly. Islam taught me to protect the weak and the disenfranchised, right? Those are the things, those are the principles that Islam teaches us, but people often don't recognize that. And we need to express that openly, that Islam promotes this uh, virtuous, contributing citizenship uh, that often Islam doesn't get recognized for. So that would be my take on that, that let's just not put all of the onus on the, the NCCM, but whatever capacity we have, we should try to do. And in whatever space you're in, try to do those presentations, try to talk about your faith, try to educate and increase uh, conversation. And yes, it's difficult, you know, it's never easy. But at the end of the day, this is something that you will be rewarded for by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more you do it, the easier it gets. We often fear that what if someone asks me a question that I don't know how to answer? And the solution to that is simple. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, فَاسْأَلُوا أَحْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ That ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. So, you get asked something that you don't know the answer to. There's absolutely no shame and no harm in saying, look, I don't know the answer to this right now, but why don't you give me your phone number, give me your email address, and I will find an answer for you. And then you contact someone that does. Alhamdulillah, in the city of Ottawa, you have uh, some amazing people. You have you know, the, the Council of Imams, inshallah, that has some great people that you can reach out to for help. You have the NCCM that you can reach out to for help. You have these Muslim academics and scholars that you can reach out to uh, for help. Um, so those are some of the things that I would suggest and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best.